Einstein and the story of Lumen. The Avatar of Beyond Light. Conversation held during April 1920 destroyed an illusion which had become dear to me. It concerned the fantastic figure, Lumen, conceived as an actual human being, imagined as endowed with an extraordinary power of motion and keenness of sight. Mr. Lumen is supposed to be the invention of the astronomer Flammarion, who produced him in the retort of fancy as Faust produced homunculus to use him to prove the possibility of very remarkable happenings, in particular, the reversal of time. Einstein declared outright, Firstly, Lumen is not due to Flammarion, who has derived him from other sources. And secondly, Lumen can in no way be used as a means of proving things. Moskowski, it is at least very interesting to operate with him. Lumen is supposed to have a velocity greater than that of light. Let us assume this as given, then the rest follows quite logically. If, for example, he leaves the earth on the day of a great event, such as the Battle of Waterloo, and, may I trace out this example at the risk of tiring you? Einstein, do repeat it, and act as if you were telling something entirely new. It is clear that the Lumen story gives you great amusement, so please talk quite freely. But I cannot forgo the privilege of showing later how the whole adventure and its consequences must be demolished. Moskowski. Well then, the person, Lumen, sets off at the end of the Battle of Waterloo to make an excursion into space with a speed of 250,000 miles per second. He thus catches up all the light rays that left the field of battle and moved in his direction. After an hour, he will already have attained a lead of about 20 minutes. This lead will be gradually increased so that at the end of the second day, he will no longer be seeing the end of the battle at the beginning. What has Lumen been seeing in the meantime? Clearly, he has been observing events happening in the reverse direction, as in the case of a cinematograph which is exhibiting pictures backwards. He saw the projectiles leaving the objects they had struck and returning into the mouths of the cannon. He saw the dead come to life, arise, and arrange themselves into battalion order. He would thus arrive at an exactly opposite view of the passing of time, for what he observes is as much his experience as what we observe is ours. If he had seen all the battles of history and, in fact, all events happening in the reverse order, then in his mind. Before and after would be interchanged. That is, he would experience time backwards. What are causes to us would be effects to him, and our effects would be his causes. Antecedents and consequence would change places, and he would arrive at a causality diametrically opposite to our own. He would be quite as justified in adopting in his view of the happening of things according to his experiences and of the causal nexus as it appears to him as we are justified in adopting ours. Einstein, and the whole story is mere humbug, absurd, and based on false premises leading to entirely false conclusions. Moskowski but it is only to be taken as an imaginary experiment that plays with fantastic impossibilities to direct our ideas on to the relativity of time by a striking illustration. Did not Henri Poincaré adduce this extreme example to discuss the reversal of time? Einstein. You may rest assured that Poincaré, even if he used this example as an entertaining digression in his lectures, took the same view of Lumen as I do. It is not an imaginary experiment. It is a farce, or, to express it more bluntly, it is a mere swindle. These experiences and topsy-turvy perceptions have just as little to do with the relativity of time, such as it is taught by the new mechanics, as have the personal sensations of a man to whom time seems long or short according as he experiences pain or pleasure, amusement or boredom. For in this case, at least the subjective sensation is a reality, whereas Lumen cannot have reality because his existence is based on nonsense. Lumen is to have a speed greater than that of light. This is not only an impossible, but a foolish assumption, because the theory of relativity has shown that the velocity of light cannot be exceeded. However great the accelerating force may be, 
and for however long it may act, it cannot cause this limit to be transcended. Lumen is supposed to be equipped with the organ of sight, that is, he is supposed to have a corporal existence. But the mass of a body becomes infinitely great when it reaches the velocity of light, so that it is quite absurd to go beyond this stage. It is admissible to operate with impossibilities in imagination, that is, with things that contradict our practical experience, but not with absolute nonsense. That is why the other adventure of Lumen, in which he jumps to the moon, is also an absurdity. In this, he is supposed to leap with a speed greater than light, and when he reaches the moon, to turn round instantaneously with the result that he sees himself jumping from the moon to the earth backwards. This jump is logically meaningless, and if we try to make deductions of an optical nature from such a nonsensical assumption, we deceive ourselves. Moskowski Nevertheless, I should claim extenuating circumstances for this case on the ground that I am enlisting the help of the conception of impossibility. A journey even at a speed of only 1,000 miles per second is impossible for a man or a homunculus. Einstein. Yes, according to our experience, if we measure it against facts. We cannot state definitely that a journey into the universe at an enormous yet limited velocity is absolutely impossible. Within the indicated bounds, every play of thought that is argued correctly is allowable. Moskowski. Now, suppose that I strip Lumen of all bodily organs and take him as being a pure creature of thought, entirely without substance. A velocity greater than that of light can be imagined, even if it cannot be realized physically. If, for example, we think of a lighthouse with a revolving light and consider a beam of light about 600 miles long, which rotates 200 times per second, then we could represent to ourselves that the light at the circumference of this beam travels with a speed of nearly 760,000 miles per second. Einstein. As for that, I can give you a much better example of the same thing. We need only imagine that the Earth is poised in space, motionless and non-rotating. This is physically admissible. Then the most distant stars, as judged by us, would describe their paths with almost unlimited velocities. But this projects us right out of the world of reality into a pure fiction of thought, which, if followed to its conclusion, leads to the most degenerate form of imagination, namely to pathological individualism. It is in these realms of thought that such perversities as the reversal of time and causality occur. Moskowski Dreams, too, are confined to the individual. Reality constrains all human beings to exist in one and the same world, whereas, in dreams, each one has his own world with a different kind of causality. Nevertheless, dreams are a positive experience and signify a reality for the dreamer. Even for waking reality, it would be easy to construct cases in which the causal relationship is shattered. Suppose a person who has grown up in a confined retreat, such as Caspar Hauser, looks in a mirror for the first time in his life. As he knows nothing of the phenomena of optical reflection, he sees in it a new, objective world that gives a shock to, or even subverts, his own idea of causality, insofar as it may have become developed in him. Lumen sees himself jump backwards, whereas Caspar Hauser sees himself performing gestures on the wrong side of his body. Should it not be possible to draw a reasonable parallel between these two cases? Einstein. Quite impossible. However you set about it, your Lumen will inevitably come to grief on the conception of time. Time, denoted in physical expressions by the symbol T, may indeed be given a negative value in these equations, so that an event may be calculated in the reverse direction. But then, we are dealing with pure matters of calculation, and in this case, we must not allow ourselves to be drawn into the erroneous belief that time itself may travel negatively, that is, retrogressively. This is the root of the misapprehension, that what is allowable and indeed necessary in calculations is confused with what may be thought possible in reality. 
Whoever seeks to derive new knowledge from the excursions of a creature like Lumen into space confuses the time of an experience with the time of the objective event, but the former can have a definite meaning only if it is founded on a proper causal relation of space and time. In the above imaginary experiment, the order of the experiences in time is the reverse of that of the events, and as far as causality is concerned, it is a scientific conception that relates only to events ordered in space and time, and not to experiences. In brief, the experiments with Lumen are swindles. Moskowski, I must resign myself to giving up these illusions. I must frankly confess that I do so with a certain sadness, for such bold flights of constructive fancy exert a powerful attraction on me. At one time, I was near outdoing Lumen by assuming a superlumen who was to traverse all worlds at once with infinite velocity. He would then be in a position to take a survey of the whole of universal history at a single glance. From the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, he would see the Earth as it was four years ago, from the Pole Star as it was forty years ago, and from the boundary of the Milky Way as it was 4,000 years ago. At the same moment, he could choose a point of observation that would enable him to see the First Crusade, the Siege of Troy, the Flood, and also the events of the present day simultaneously. Einstein. And this flight of thought, which, by the way, has been indulged in repeatedly by others too, has much more sense in it than the former one, because you may make an abstraction which disregards speed altogether, it is only a limiting case of reflection. Moskowski. I should like to touch on other limiting cases, in particular two that I find it impossible to interpret. Lotz mentions them in his logic. The first concerns the infinitely long lever whose fulcrum, or turning point, is at the confines of the universe. According to the laws of levers, a mass of magnitude zero will suffice to keep in equilibrium at the end of the other lever arm any weight, no matter whether it is a million times heavier than the earth. Our imaginations cannot even picture this, yet I cannot feel satisfied with the mere explanation that it is an exceptional case, an extension of a general law to a case in which it is no longer applicable. The second example is still more perplexing because it does not require a journey into other worlds but leads us into inconceivable consequences, even if we remain on the earth. Lotz considers this second limiting case easier. To me, it seems more difficult. It is this. The force that a wedge exerts is inversely proportional to its thickness. If it is infinitely thin, this formula gives an infinitely great result whereas, actually, the force exerted is nil. This very thin wedge, transformed finally into a geometrical plane, should be able to split in twain any wooden or even steel block. And now, consider a special arrangement of this wedge, in which it is resting with its extremely sharp edge vertically downwards, whereas at the top it broadens to a little ledge which supports a weight. We then get the incredible result that this wedge, which can be imagined concretely, should be able to cut through the whole earth with its extremely fine edge if placed on some base. Where is the fallacy in this case? Einstein. The mechanical facts have not been taken sufficiently into consideration. He illustrated his further remarks by drawing a few strokes with his pen and proved from his diagram that a wedge of this sort would be able to perform what I assumed, only if the base on which it is placed is composed of separate laminae. Otherwise, the assumption that the force is infinitely great would be erroneous. The final result stated by Einstein was, the universe, both as regards extent and mass, has finite limits and can be measured. If anyone asks whether this can be pictured, I shall not deprive him of the hope. All that is required is a power of imagination that is great enough to follow a pictorial description and that can take up the right attitude towards a sort of figurative representation. <laughs>